Hey, everybody. Welcome back to our monthly market commentary. As always, I'm Brad Gatto, founder and CEO of Fiat Wealth Management. And as always, I've got my sidekick here with me, uh, Mr. Tim Holland, the chief investment officer of Orion Town Square and for us here at Fiat. So, Tim, as always, thank you for being here, sir. Yeah, good to see you, Brad. Happy New Year. Yeah, um, Happy New Year to you as well. Yeah, uh, those calendar pages turn the older you get, they turn quicker and quicker. But um, <laughs> I hope you and your family had a wonderful holiday and and wishing you all and, and all of Fiat and all of Fiat's clients uh, just a happy, healthy, prosperous 2024 for sure. Well, I appreciate that. Uh, before we get into our monthly market update, uh, real quick, Tim, I'm just curious. Are you a, a New Year's resolution guy? Oh, man, I was worried. The minute you said before we get into this, I was like, that's <laughs> where he's going. And I'm, I'm not. I'm not because um, I've seen kind of the data where it just seems yeah. like everyone tries and then like three weeks in the wheels come off the cart. Um, so at the risk of sounding like, oh, boy, isn't he a great person kind of guy? I'm just going sort of big picture, you know, through a little calmer, a little more thoughtful, a little more considerate, a little more patient. And, sure. and the good thing about that is you can't quantify any of that. So really, no one knows except <laughs> me. Yeah, if, nobody if can I check in it. on you and see no. if you're doing well or not doing I'm well. I'm not trying to lose 10 pounds, right? You can't, that you can measure. So yeah. it, all kin inside, it's a little more kind of mindfulness oriented. So yeah. how about you? Um, I'm on the opposite end of the spectrum, actually. Okay. And I don't think there's a right or wrong answer to this. I just, I'm a big goal setting guy. Okay. And the the start of the year, one of the things that I appreciate more than anything is that yeah. you can get more people on board with you in goal setting on January 1 than you can any other time in the year. So yeah. whether that's on a corporate level at Fiat and trying to set goals for the firm and getting, you know, everybody at Fiat to kind of, uh, you know, buy into that, yeah. or it's getting your friends to yeah. try to lose 10 pounds with you or yeah. something like that. It's always easier at the first of the year. And so I just use this as an opportunity to take advantage of, of uh, right. suckering well, my friends and colleagues into into goal setting with me. All right. Well, no, good for you and good luck. And we'll be checking yeah, thank in. Thank you. We'll be checking uh, in every month. Yeah. Um, every month. So here every we go. Right. Uh, we always have three points. If uh, you're new to our monthly market updates, point number one is always look back on what just happened the previous month. Point number two is a look ahead to what we expect for the upcoming month. And then we always just throw on a third point, which is a really interesting, as we see it, data point that is worth discussing. So, uh, Tim, a look back. Uh, we're calling this point, our look back, a strong finish with yep. a sub title of the Fed did what we thought. Yep. And we have a broadening of the bull market. There's two points there that yep. I want to cover. So let's start with point number one. We had a strong finish of the year. And partly it's because the Fed did what we thought. If you go back and watch our previous monthly market commentary, um, you'll you'll know we the prediction of what we thought was coming was true. That's not always going to be the case, no. <laughs> um, but it happened. So let's talk about the Fed first. Why do we have a strong yeah. finish? Yeah, no, it's, uh, you're absolutely right. So the S&P, if we focus on that as a broad benchmark, was up 4.5% for December. That followed on a very strong November. Um, and for the year, 26%, give or take, for the world's most important equity benchmark. And to your point, the, the big news was sort of no news out of the Fed uh, December yeah. meeting, which was they didn't raise rates. We didn't think they would raise uh, rates and, and they didn't. They sat on their hands again. Um, the, 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 the real um, action out of the meeting was in the uh, summary of economic projections, the, the famous dot plot where the Fed kind of polls its own members and sort of where do you think GDP is going to be and inflation and interest rates. And uh, the Fed had has now penciled in three rate cuts for 2024. Uh, that's more than they had guided to uh, in the prior uh, dot plot or, or summary of economic projections. And Chairman Powell made it clear that they're done raising rates. And it was really, I think, that language in particular at the press conference yeah. um, that really got the market excited that we really um, um, have seen the end of the rate hiking cycle. And then it's a question of, okay, when does the Fed pivot uh, from hiking to pausing to cutting? Now there, the market, and we've talked about this, might be getting a little bit ahead of itself, but I think that was the big macro and market moving uh, development. And then to your point, if you want to kind of dig into the other uh, uh, other um, development of note last month was small cap stocks 
at least as measured by the Russell 2000, were up over 12%. And and so easily outdistance the the big guys that and and gals that make up the S and P five hundred, and I think that's meaningful for a couple reasons. Um, one, small cap stocks tend to do better when yields come in and interest rates are going to be moving lower because they're just more sensitive to borrowing costs. They don't have those super big balance sheets with yeah. a ton of cash. Um, and a lot of last year was driven by as your your clients I'm sure have heard the term the magnificent seven. You know, the the apples of the world, the mega cap tech companies doing yep. a lot of the heavy lifting for the S&P and that great performance from small cap stocks speaks to a broadening out of the bull market, uh, which got started in June, more companies participating. And typically that's a very healthy uh, dynamic from a sort of look under the hood at the market fundamentals and technicals, that sort of perspective. Um, so that that's a very, very positive uh, development, we think, for uh, that kind of speaks to hopefully the longevity and the strength and the durability of the move higher that we've all experienced for for several months now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So to to summarize, and if I'm off base here, as always, <laughs> correct me. Uh, but the Fed did what we thought. That's that's a pretty key point. But then this broadening of the market, in essence, the point there, Tim, is that up until recently, the majority of the rally in the markets last year yeah. was from a handful of companies. Yep. While that's good, you know, that they're doing that. And if you're invested in those companies, uh, that you're seeing the returns that you saw, it, it's not necessarily good for the broad market. Just because a handful of companies are doing good doesn't mean the overall economy is doing good. Yeah. So then at the end of the year, when you see small companies, small cap companies, which small companies are not like fiat, right? Small, small cap, uh, publicly traded companies and you probably know this data better than I do. Is what two to ten billion in that range? Yeah, that's that's usually the 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 sort of the uh, the bookends that folks on Wall Street use for smaller companies. At yeah, two to ten, and I yep. I haven't looked it up recently. What's the market cap of Apple? Oh, in north of a trillion dollars. Yeah, it's so a stunning, <laughs> stunning number. Both stunning publicly number. traded, but very, yeah. very, very different. And so now we've seen kind of the small guy, so to speak, at least in yeah. the publicly traded market world, um, have a really good month. And so the broadening of hey, it's not just a couple people doing well. Yeah. The broader market looks like it's kind of getting healthier is a positive sign for what would normally, from an indication standpoint, lead to a longer term bull market. Yep, for sure. Okay. How about a look ahead? So we just talked about what happened last month. Look ahead. I'm I'm calling this point a new year, whether you like resolutions or not. <laughs> um, and the, the sub point here is either jolting forward or tampering expectations. Jolting yeah. forward, referencing this jolt report that's coming out. Yep. Um, or actually, actually it came out, didn't it? Yeah, yeah, it uh, came out yesterday, uh, which is yesterday. The third. Okay. Yep. And then tampering expectations because going back to the old Fed, it seems like we yep. can't ever get away from them. They were like the topic of conversation last year and yeah. what they were doing. And here we are in a new year, and I can't get away from them. Um, is that they have talked about cutting rates yeah. up to three times? It seems as though the market is building in more expectation than that. And of course that could lead to bad things, right? Cause what yep. if they don't follow through? So let's talk about both sides of that and kind of the jolt side of it. And then the tampering yeah. of expectations. Side. No, I th and I think tying those two things together makes a ton of sense because as we know, you know, the, 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 the focus has been uh, on the fed and interest rates for several years now, uh, the concerns around the recession or recession have been pretty uh, have been pretty um, um, uh, significant because the Fed's going to raise rates a lot. They did. They're going to make the cost of capital go up, and people are going to lose their jobs, and businesses will go out of business, and so on. And but the jobs market is really really hung hung in there. And so we yeah. got the Jolts report uh, yesterday, January third. That's the Job Opening Labor Turnover Survey. That's the acronym uh, that speaks to to that that Jolt speaks to. For November, and it showed the number of job openings sort of came in line with expectations. So uh, down meaningfully uh, when the labor market was really ripping, but still still a fair amount of open positions. And then tomorrow, uh, we had a crystal ball because tomorrow we get the jobs report for December. And I think a lot of what's going to drive how quickly the Fed gets to cutting rates is going to be the strength of the labor market. And yep. so if you get a really strong uh, December number tomorrow on January uh, 5th, um, that's probably going to get the Fed thinking that, OK, if we are going to cut, we're probably cutting further down the road. If you start to get some weak uh, uh, jobs reports between now and when the Fed 
uh, meets in March and, and obviously later this month, um, then that's going to sort of speed up the process. I, th I think if you're the Fed, um, and this gets back to sort of tampering expectations, to your point, the Fed is penciled in three rate cuts. The market, at least as of now, is penciling in six and penciling in the first cut as soon as the March meeting. So the Fed meets mm. January 31st is the second of the two day meeting. Then they meet again in March. I think if you're if you're the Fed, unless you get some shockingly bad news, you know, you're going to use the January meeting to kind of say, OK, everyone, you know, we're done hiking rates, but we're not in a super great rush to, to cut because the last thing the Fed wants to do is start to cut rates. And then you get some sort of inflation data point that surprises to the upside. And then all of a sudden they've got to go back to this much more hawkish monetary yeah. footing. Yep. So I think it's going to be about the strength of the labor market, and that's going to drive the Fed and what it does this year. But given that things look pretty good, I think the Fed's going to just try and get everyone to just kind of calm down a little bit. We're going to get to cuts, but probably not as soon as Wall Street would like. And and I think that's um, going to be the big sort of dance that's going to play out the first couple, four months of, of this year. Yeah. Uh, just very interesting, right? Because yeah. we've gotten to a point where this kind of tipping point of, yeah, we've agreed to stop raising yeah. rates. They've been explicit in that. But the market's expectations and the Fed's expectations of how and when yeah. they're going to cut rates are different. Yeah. Um, and of course, <laughs> it's one of those interesting things always with the market that where the market stands today isn't indicative of, of the economy today. It's indicative of where they think the economy is going. So he's kind of a, a guess yeah. to the future. Yeah. Uh, and so the market has a pretty rosy scenario built in their head, so to speak, of, of what's going to happen. Because, of course, it, it may, I just want to make sure that I'm not being assumptive of what people know or understand. If the Fed is going to cut rates and cut them dramatically, like six times throughout the year, that means the velocity of money moves faster. Like it's easier for money to move around because the cost of borrowing goes down and it allows for companies like take small cap companies. We just got done talking about and the borrowing cost for growth to go down, which means they're more apt to do it. And it fuels and can spark growth. Yeah. And so if the market is assuming six rate cuts, they're assuming that spark or that money movement to, to happen which means they're pretty rosy on where things are going to go. Um, so it's possible that they don't meet expectations. And that's that tampering of yeah. expectations for this year. Now, yeah. we just came off a 26% return in the S&P overall, you know, bonds who have, you know, bonds have had a tough go yeah. <laughs> for, for a while. They actually had a decent year last year. So between both equity markets and debt markets, uh, we just came out of a good year. And so I think, Tampering expectations going into this year is probably a pretty prudent thing to do and yeah. not expecting the Fed to immediately turn and say, hey, the second we stop cutting, we're immediately going to or stop raising. We're immediately going to start cutting without giving any sort of like reprieve or time to kind of let things play out or simmer down, yeah. um, I think is unrealistic. Again, that's my opinion. I have no idea, just like you have no idea, um, but points well said. So Yeah, no, no I, th I think you're right. And, and I think to your point, the S&P does 26, bonds do 5 to 6% after a very, very tough couple of years. Unemployment's still sitting at sub 4%. Uh, inflation has come down meaningfully. Um, you know, if if you're Jay Powell and the Fed, after taking a lot of justified criticism when talking about inflation being transitory and, and all of that, and then pivoting, you know, and 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 I wouldn't want that job because, you know, those folks are a lot smarter than than, than I am and they struggle with it. You know, you're probably feeling pretty good um, yeah. considering the size and the complexity of the economy and all the pressure you're under from Wall Street and other central banks and investors around the world. So, yeah. So I think if you've gotten it to this point and, and inflation's moderating, and the economy's hanging in there, markets are, are meaningfully higher. Um, it, you, there's no need to be super aggressive in terms of cutting, because, again, the last thing you want to do is cut, see growth spike, but maybe then that pushes up inflation. And then you're kind of back to 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 it again. So I think, yeah, yeah I think it, it is going to be about tampering and, and, for, and justifiably so tampering down uh, uh, Wall Street's expectations. Well, if the first couple of days of the year in the market are any indication, <laughs> I'm kidding. Um, all right. Our data point worth discussing. I'm going to call this the great cash 
push. Uh, because last year, Tim, we went from five, and I these numbers aren't even fathomable to me. Yeah, Anytime no. a number, you know, starts with a T, a trillion, I don't even get it. But there was five trillion dollars roughly in yeah. cash in our system at the beginning of last year. Now there's six. That's a twenty yeah. percent increase in cash last year. Um, why is that an interesting data point, and why should people care? Yeah. So one of uh, my favorite websites, and I know your team uses it as well, uh, St. Louis Fed. Uh, so so the, the Fed Reserve Bank of St. Louis, the, the Fed, as we know, is made up of a series of regional banks. Uh, most of them have free uh, research websites. Uh, the, 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 the site for the Bank of St. Louis is, is FRED. Um, yep. Fantastic uh, interactive charting capabilities. And to your point, Brad, uh, cash and money market funds went from five to six trillion in, in a year or less than a year. And so it parabolic move up. And I think that was driven by a couple of things. One, if we go back almost a year now, and, and it's great that it's kind of fading uh, from, from view, you had a banking crisis. So yeah. Silicon Valley, First Isn't Republic. Isn't it funny how quickly we forget how, yeah. how fearful yeah. people were? Right. And, and so, and at the risk of sounding too Pollyannish, and you're right, you know, 2024 is off to a little bit of a bumpy start. Um, people probably got a little too excited. Who knows? We we take uh, we all take a long term view of things. But, you know, if you think about last year, you had a banking crisis, you had a credit downgrade, right? Fitch downgraded the U.S.'s credit rating. You had an oil price spike and you had Hamas attack Israel um, and the markets did what they did. So just yeah. the resiliency of the system is is pretty Incredible. Um, yep. But I, I think, yeah, that banking crisis, those three banks fail, get sort of paired off with bigger, uh, better capitalized uh, uh, banks. And so I think some money just left the traditional banking system, uh, deposit accounts and went to money market funds. And I think a lot of money was just continuing to come out of the market, coming out of a really bad 2022. And as as money market funds started offering, you know, pretty competitive and compelling yep. rates of return, it's like 2022 was god awful. Um, I'm going to put my money in a money market fund now. If you did that, I get it. And and yeah. and there's a, a a role for cash in any diversified portfolio. Um, but now you've obviously obviously had a 26 move in percent move in the S and P. So rates of return on money market funds and and short term instruments went up because of what the Fed was doing. I think there's fears around the banking system, a lot of bad muscle memory after a very tough 2022 all conspired to, to, to see that cash number go from five to six. So what's interesting is if the Fed is really done raising and, and they should be, and then they do get to cut in at some point and the yield on the US 10 year notes at 4% now, it's not at 5% where it was, those rates of return on those money market instruments should also start to come down as well. And yep. if we are really in a sustained bull market and nothing goes straight up, and bonds after a rough 2021 and 2022 are still going to be okay. There's a lot of proverbial money on the sidelines, a record amount to some extent, that could find its way back into uh, the market. And and the big catalyst, I think, would be either further gains for stocks and bonds or and or just a dropping in the rates of return on those money market funds as the Fed starts to cut cut rates. So that there could be a lot of dry powder, as they say, as you know, in our business. Yeah that could come back into risk assets. So that's something we're paying paying attention to for sure. Yeah. So, I mean, obviously good news can drive markets. Um, results can drive markets, but just cash. People just yep. flooding the system uh, with more cash can drive yep. markets. And so it's interesting to note that we're sitting on more cash than we've ever had yep. um, on the sidelines right now with that $6 trillion mark. Um, and so just going to be something that's worth watching in 2024 yep. and what happens to that cash that's sitting on the sidelines. It's For interesting. Sure. You brought up a point, and I think this is a good way to kind of close out our yeah. update here. Um, always try to close it with some sort of like good long-term financial planning advice, right? Because uh, we're talking about month over month changes in the market, interesting data points, and these are all in the micro, um, in the macro. Take last year, which still isn't very macro, but it's one year. You made a point at the beginning of the year, we had a banking crisis, right? Um, we also had, what was the other point you made? Yeah, other, we credit, had Hamas. Yeah, credit downgrade, Hamas. Credit downgrade. I remember yeah. being in the middle of that and kind of the, you know, everybody was like, oh my gosh, you know, yeah. face to palm kind of thing. Um, and then not only that, that we faced 
all three of those big events. We had yeah. a rising interest rate environment. Yep, for sure. And yeah, the Fed didn't stop months? raising until July. Yeah. And the price of crude made a run at a hundred bucks a barrel. Yeah. Rising oil prices. Yeah. So think about that banking crisis, uh, debt downgrade, U S debt downgrade, um, a new war started, yeah. uh, the oil going up to basically almost hundred dollars a barrel. And then the raising of interest rates and harder to borrow money for the average consumer, uh, whether that's for a mortgage, a car or otherwise. If yeah. I would have given those five data points to anybody at the beginning of 2023 and said, these are the things that are going to happen this year. Now you have to decide if you're going to be in equities or not be in equities. Yeah. I, I just don't know too many people that would have been like, yeah, yeah I'm going to take that bet. Yeah. Um, I agree. You know, it's like betting on David over Goliath kind yeah. of situation. Yeah. Uh, yet here we stand. It's the beginning of 2024. We, we get to look back and say, you know, major indices were up, S&P being 26%. We even made money on the debt side of the table yeah. after a really couple bad years uh, yeah. with fixed income. I just don't know that anybody would have guessed it. And it's it's just, the reason I bring that up is because as I talk to prospects and clients, Tim, and I know you get this too, you hear it all the time. There's always two or three reasons that everybody has for why not to invest or why yep. not to stay invested. Yep. Well, Brad, Yes, that stuff happened, but here's what's coming. Here's what yeah. could happen. Here's yeah. what might happen. And because yeah. of these things, whatever, insert whatever fear they have yep. or, or you know, talking points in the news, I'm not going to invest right now. Or yeah. I want to pull my money out or whatever yeah. it may be. Yeah. Then on top of that, look at last year, you know, the 26%, we made the comment of the broadening market in the, in the small cap space. If you look at what small caps and those indices were doing throughout the year, Versus what these mega caps were doing and tried to make a decision of like, well, gosh, I should take all my money out of these crappy small caps and move yeah. these into these mega caps. Um, we would have missed out on some pretty stellar returns in that part yep. of the portfolio. I only bring that up because I had a couple of clients actually you know, make comments like that. of, Hey, what are yeah. we doing? This portion of the portfolio over here is, stinks. You know, it's yeah. not doing anything. Um, so all that to say, long-term planning is, is super important. And if, yep. if you're going to believe in our free market system, yep. then you should be invested in it. And if you don't believe in the long-term viability of it, then you just shouldn't be invested in it. Yeah. Um, different ways to get things done, but yeah, uh, no, Tim, well said, well said. Yeah. Anything you want to add to that before I, yeah, yeah, no, I, I at the risk of sounding uh, a little Pollyannish, uh, I agree with everything you said. And then <laughs> for me, it's always, well, what would change that right dynamic? Um, cause you're right. If you listed out those four or five things, no one's going to say, Hey, let's go long us stocks in 26%. Um, and then to your point, the bounce in small caps, they're up 12 in December, they're up 25% just off their October lows of last year and just crazy returns. And so for me, even with all of the challenges our country is facing our problems, you know, that the underpinnings, the, the for-profit mechanism, the reasonable tax yep. rates, the respective personal property, physical and intellectual, um, a trusted judicial system. Trans like until we blow all that up, and I hope to God we never do, um, the bias should always be towards uh, investing, taking risk, because the underpinnings of the system point you towards an ever-expanding economy and ever-rising corporate profits. And until they get rid of that stuff, that's gonna be sort of my default position yeah. as well so yeah well there's your call to action if you're watching this uh, is uh understanding long-term financial planning in the scope of where we live um yep. and what risk actually means inside of the markets in which we are primarily invested in uh yeah. tim it's always fun man this is one of my yeah. uh things i look forward to most every single month so i appreciate yeah. it as always that you taking the time uh and we will see you in february sir i'll see you in february take care yeah